Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Diabetes Australia Facebook Live question and answer session. I'm Renza Shabilia from Diabetes Australia. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands where we are all viewing from. I'm in Wurundjeri land, and I would like to um, pass on my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today, we're talking about a Diabetes Australia campaign, If I Had Known. And this campaign is um, one that we absolutely love. We've run this for a couple of years now. We speak with people living with diabetes in the community and we ask that question, what would have been made a difference if you had known this at diagnosis? Today, I am joined by Sarah and Natesh and we are going to be speaking about their experiences of living with diabetes. Now, this campaign focuses on people living with type 2 diabetes in the community. However, as somebody living with type 1 diabetes, I know that there is a lot that I that um, I think that if I had known these things at my diagnosis, uh, my diabetes outcome probably would have been a lot different. So we're going to talk about that. So if you've got anything you'd like to share, please use the comments on our Facebook page and we will get to that. And um, and, and just have a listen and, and hear. But I'm going to introduce our... Or actually, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves. Natasha, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your type 2 diabetes story. Thank you. Thank you, Renja, and thank you, David Australia, for giving this opportunity to be on the live and sharing my story. Um, actually, I'm living with this condition since 2008. So firstly, it was diagnosed during my initial uh, GB visit uh, when they did the um, glucose tolerance test. Yes. And after then, back in 2010, when I did again similar test, it showed uh, kind of a uh, progression uh, kind of a result, like uh, I was intolerance with the glucose. So my right. sugar level was really high. And then, yeah, and then I started medication since then. So since then I'm uh, living and uh, managing my condition, but something different I discovered since last year. We're going to uh, speak with you a little bit about some of the changes that you've made since you were diagnosed with um, with type 2 diabetes because they've been quite significant. So I'm looking forward to hearing your story, but thanks so much for your introduction there. Sarah, now Sarah is perhaps a well-known face to people who have visited our Q&As or our other events that we've run here before. Sarah was one of the faces of our 2021 National Diabetes Week campaign, which was all about mental health and stigma. Sarah, it's so good to see you again. How are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very, very well. Um, so we might need you to refresh our memories for those of us either who, who haven't um, seen you speak before or just need a little bit of a refresher. Tell us a little bit about you and your life with type 2 diabetes. Uh, I got diagnosed about 13 years ago. Um, at the time, I was doing 24-7 shift work. So wow. that wasn't good for diabetes either. Um, also, I've got a strong family history of type 2 diabetes. So I was very aware that I, um, anytime I did any sort of blood tests, I got them to, to test for diabetes as well. Um, yeah. And I was probably four years a few years after a pretty bad car accident mm -hmm. and um, the stress physically that my body went through probably um, helped bring on the diabetes earlier as okay. well. So I yeah. started off on medication tablets um, and um, my body didn't like them. Mm -hmm. So I then started using insulin. So I'm type 2 insulin dependent yeah. diabetic. I have to say, Sarah, I do love a bit or a lot actually about how proactive you were knowing that there is diabetes in your family and so making sure that that was something that was mentioned at checkups. And I think that that's one of those really important issues because there are things that we can't do anything about when it comes to diabetes and one of those is our family history. So yep. if there is type 2 diabetes in your family, that's certainly a conversation to be having with your healthcare prof professional when you're visiting them, when you're visiting your GP. So one of the things that um, if I had known is all about is those small changes that we can make towards being a little healthier. Now, this is not about blaming and shaming people or about being negative about, you know, get off your backside and go for a run because we acknowledge that these things are really, really tough. 
everybody knows what we should be eating and what we should be doing and how much exercise we should be doing. And there are very few people, I think, who actually tick all those boxes. But what I love about this campaign, it's about those really small things that you can do and setting yourself goals that can be quite manageable but actually yield terrific results. So, Natasha, let me come to you and let me talk to you about that. What were some of those things that you did, those little changes that you started to make? Um, the first thing I did was I started waking up in the morning and following sunlight. Ah, so, tell us about that. Okay, initially, um, when I, I used to work for a um, couple of organisations where um, I end up working late nights. Mm -hmm. and never had a chance to catch up in the sun so after realizing like how important the sunlight is and how important to get your immune system into optimum level then i started uh, catching the sunlight getting into the sun for half an hour to 45 minutes uh, when uv are really low so that helped me to get rid of my back pains and the right. aches in the body and then i started working out in the morning and I went off from gym and started doing brisk walking. So walking, okay. but how it helped is, as everyone knows, like it regulates your blood sugar level and insulin level. Mm -hmm. So that way I discovered if I do a high intensity, uh, intense kind of a strength workout in the morning, that will elevate my blood sugar level. So I don't want my sugar level to go high. Yes. And in the morning, every time I used to get um, high level due to Down syndrome. So just to get away from Down syndrome and to elevating my sugar level, I started very low intensity workout, walking in the morning and getting into the sun and a food. So my yeah. thoughts goes around more into nutritional dense food rather than exercise. So I'm a fitness trainer, but I advocate more on nutrition now. Yeah. So those changes were, I mean, you know, getting up earlier and all of these sorts of things, they sound like just little things, but I'm sure that they probably took time for you to actually get used to that. I know that I'm not a morning person. I'm not a morning person at all. Um, so getting up, you know, to, at, at that time of day might be a little bit difficult for me. How did you go about making that change? Was it just a matter of setting an alarm and just saying today I'm going to do it? Or did it take a while to get used to that? How, how did you do that? Actually, I challenged myself because... Yeah. Uh, I let it go. I, I followed the normal lifestyle. So that's how I end up with type 2 diabetic. And then I said, if, if it's getting too late and if, if I won't fix now, it will be an issue in the future. So let's challenge. And one at a time, it took me nearly three years to uh, kind of a resetting my system because it's still I'm type 2. I have an autoimmune kind of a um the metabolic syndrome going on but to minimize the risks in the future that's how i put myself in a strict discipline so i challenged myself change everything what i was eating what i was doing and it was yeah. pretty tough for me and for family yeah. as well but i got the support from my uh, my better half my best half and then my family members did uh, appreciate it that they won't say anything the way i eat because i eat literally very different way than how my family are uh, eating oh. so these things are looks harder but it will get used to and your life become easier that way okay we're going to come back to talking about support because i think that that is something that's really really critical but sarah let me ask you have there been some changes that you've made that you sort of look back now and think gosh if I'd known that, I would have done that sooner or I'm really glad that I've done it. Again, as I said, this isn't about saying, gosh, look, I you know, should have done this before. It's if I had known, maybe I would have made some changes, but I'm doing that now. So let me ask you about that. Are there any things that you've done that are different? You said that you were working 24-7 shift work. Is yeah, it doing that? No, no, that was, right. it's really hard work for yeah. anyone, but that was something that I wish uh, I wish I wasn't, I, I don't do anymore and I yeah. won't go back to okay. doing, um, I would do like stand up shifts where I would start work, say at 7.30 at night, I would work in um, a residential unit and then I would um, uh, be, or I might start at 11 and then go through till seven in the morning and I'd have to be awake all night and it mucked up my sleeping. It was, uh, it, 
my eating, it was no good on lots of levels. Um, at the minute, I do shift work that's not like that, but I do like the AM shift and I've requested that I do all AMs. Yep. Um, and uh, that's a lot easier for me being consistent when I eat as yep. well. Instead okay. of having like breakfast, say at, I don't know, five one day and then when I wake up the next day at a completely different time and it's better for me taking my medication as well. Yeah. I think one of the things that I really like about um, if I had known, it's about practical um, practical yeah. tips. Often we hear about people who are diagnosed with diabetes or some other condition and they suddenly now are running marathons or they're climbing mountains. And that's amazing. And those people absolutely should be commended. But we can't all do that. We don't all want to do that necessarily. But making small changes and being a bit more active or um, deciding to do something a little bit different, whatever it is, that is a step towards you feeling healthier and feeling better about yourself, that's a step in the right direction. And I think that's one of the, if people have a look at the campaign and we'll share a link to it in the comments so that you can easily go and have a look once we finish chatting here. You can hear the stories. We've got four people sharing their incredible stories and you can read their tips and their ideas. And I really do love the, uh, the just the practicality of it. And there's nothing in there that says, you know, you must never eat chocolate ever again because you know what? Sometimes we want to eat chocolate and that's okay. So it's it's about being practical and it's about, um, it, it, it's about being sustainable, I think, as well. Now, Natasha, you mentioned, mentioned family support. Let's talk about that. How important has that been and what's it looked like for you? Um, that comes first. Like yeah. being, being uh, diabetic, like uh, what I realized initially when I was uh, going through all the hypos and all the stuff, like hyper, emotional changes comes. Like it triggers all the time. Like you get huh? happy all of a sudden and you get upset. Yeah. So to cope with your personality with the family members, they are going also through a very tough time because you know you don't know what's going inside you. And that's yeah. you're expressing your emotions, but that emotions, the negative emotions go pass into your friends and family, and they also get a little bit of suffering. So to overcome this firsthand is comes uh, the responsibility of ourselves. Like that's how I took responsibility on me. And I said, how should I keep myself positive and get away with these kind of uh, um, changes in my moods and giving other people a hard time? And then it came through changing lifestyle and food and other habits and keeping yourself as possible positive. Because it in this contest in a life, you can't keep yourself positive all the time, but That's you right. can try. Yes. And find that is do what you love. As I said, um, uh, I just heard from Sarah, like, you change your lifestyle based on your interest because yeah. there are also things you can do to achieve your target or aim. But the most important thing is your body, yourself, your health. If you don't have your health, nothing will matter in the future. So first take step to control yourself, make your health and optimize your health and well-being. And that will bring a ripple effect positive towards whoever surrounds you. That's terrific advice, it really is. Sarah, so, Sarah, can I ask you about that sort of support from family or friends or workplace? It sounds like you've got some pretty good support in the workplace, but what about in other places or in your life? Has that been important? Or, you know, for a lot of people, these are, you know, you, they are doing it on their own because, you know, they're the biggest driver and, and their own biggest champ. So whatever it works for people is the right thing to do. But, but what have you found from other people that's been useful? Um, well, at the beginning, I... And I still do now, I suppose, but like I tell people that I am diabetic, um, like my friends um, uh, and workplaces when I start a new job, because in case something happens, like I need to, if I'm having a hypo and I need to go off and grab some food or um, I'm feeling unwell and I need to sit down or if anything happens, so they know um they know what's going on so they can help me as well it's like yeah. um again with the stigma stuff like um uh there's nothing wrong with me being diabetic and i shouldn't be hiding it as well um yeah and also i've uh i've through the hospital outpatients um uh i 
I advocated to get uh, one particular um, endo there, and he's been a massive, massive help and a massive support. Yeah, I imagine that that continuity of care um, is really useful. And I think for a lot of people, it's not, unfortunately, it's not possible for everybody, but sometimes it is if you ask. And that so you've is. You've got to ask. Yeah, and I Don't think. Don't be that afraid. That's, yeah, that's one of the really big things that I think um, a lot of people say, if I'd known that earlier on, that would have made a difference for me because I felt like I was being pushed and pulled and I just didn't gel with the health professional that I was seeing, but there was one who was really great. So I'd walk out of those appointments and I'd feel really inspired and energised, walk out of others and the personality, there was a personality clash we just didn't fit. So that's, I think, a really great tip is you don't need to stay with a health professional that you don't feel is necessarily get, giving you what you need you can always ask to change you may not unfortunately especially if you're going through the public system may not necessarily be able to see the same person every time but you can certainly request that and see if you're if it's possible and if you do go privately well you can search and find the right health professionals for you and I think that's something that's really 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 important um, it's amazing actually how many times I speak with people who say that that's been one of the biggest challenges was they didn't realize that they could change and then once they did they they sort of think if I'd known I would have done this a lot a lot sooner so um, that's really that's really great now let's talk a little bit though about setbacks because you know in a perfect world we would say I'm making these changes it'd be easy to do we do it we do it consistently and that'd be it and we would be set for life but that's not the reality Natesh let me talk to you about how things go when, you know, you're struggling a little bit or where you feel you've had a setback or you just haven't perhaps been as, you know, focused on the things that you'd like to be. What, what do you say to yourself and how do you, how do you get through that? Um, yeah, it, it's to get, get into the root cause and to get out of the setbacks is to listen to your body first. That's mm -hmm. what I, I did because Yep. Sometimes I feel like no matter how I control, how no, how no matter how I keep myself active, but still my sugar level goes up. And then that's where you feel kind of frustrated. Like I'm doing everything right. I'm not eating any um, junk food or anything. I'm following every guideline. Then yep. what, what is this happening to me? And there where it comes a challenging time. And then that's where I just get into the research and follow some of the experts, um, uh, even I consulted with my doctor and then follow some of the doctors who are really famous on keto and low carb and then implement slowly on me. So that's how yeah. I uh, came across some of the practice which I discovered on my body. It might not fit to other, it might not uh, help to other body because every, everyone's body is different. But now how I realize is putting intermittent fasting um, and then following a healthy diet that will give a little bit of a gap for your body to reset. Like this morning, I, I'm since yesterday, I'm in a fasting because yesterday we had a good family get together. We had a good meal and then I couldn't avoid some of the meals. I went with eating lots of food, but now I can feel that my sugar level are going higher. So that's where like, this is the time where you have to motivate and be very patient and yes. follow and see what your body is trying to tell you. Yeah, and knowing what's right for you, I think is, is really important too. But I think, yeah, there's some really great, great stuff in there. You know, I one of the things that I've become quite good at now after living with diabetes for very close to 24 years is, uh, you know, I, people will say, well, why, why is your blood sugar low? Or why is your blood sugar high? And I used to sort of panic when people would say that, whether it was, you know, a family member or a healthcare professional or somebody who looked over and saw what my glucose levels were. And I was like, oh, this happened. Or, oh, I'd... now my response is diabetes. I have diabetes because sometimes there is no answer. Sometimes, you know, it's hormonal, there's stress, there's this, there's that. There's all sorts of things that impact. There's the weather there is actually um, uh, Adam Brown, an advocate from the US, actually wrote um, a great book. And in there he had there are 42 different things that affect your glucose levels. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not as easy as just saying, well, today I'm going to eat right and I'm going to do this and that and it'll all be perfect because that's not how diabetes works. 
And sometimes having to explain ourselves is really difficult. It's one of the key things that um, I kind of think, oh, if I'd known that, I would have, uh, you know, not had to do a lot of explaining and feeling guilty about numbers that sometimes are way beyond any control that I have. So I think that that's certainly one of the things. But I do like your very practical advice there, Nitesh. I think that's really great. What about you, Sarah? On those days where you get to the end of the day and you go, yeah, really, diabetes today just was not really where I wanted it to be. What happens yeah. tomorrow? Um, oh, well, recently I had COVID and I was quite unwell. Right, okay. I had to stop. That was stop some of my diabetes medication mm -hmm. because um, uh, I wasn't eating properly because yep. I was unwell. Um, so being unwell can affect your diabetes. Of also, um, again, part of my most recent one, I had to take steroids. Right. So, and Gosh, that, yeah. that's really bad for diabetics. They don't and go hand in hand nicely, do they? Yeah, no. So I had to be really super careful of monitoring my blood sugars yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but then again, like I'm also, I'm, I'm human and I like cakes. If I yep. want to, there was something about the last campaign. I um, like if I want to eat a bit of chocolate cake, I'm allowed to. And uh, any good diabetic knows how to tweak their insulin as well. So, yeah, absolutely. And I think that moving away from that blaming and shaming, sometimes we're our, our worst, worst uh, critics. I think um, I know that I'm probably harder on myself than anybody else in my life. So I think uh, learning about that is really important. Being kind to ourselves. That's one of the things that. I wish somebody had said to me when I was first diagnosed was stop being so hard on yourself. If I'd known that, I think that I would have spent, I would have come to a place of happiness a lot sooner when it comes to dealing with diabetes. So I guess my question then, Natasha, to you is what are the sorts of things that you would say to somebody who was newly diagnosed? What are the sorts of messages that you would like to share with them? Uh, the first thing which I missed, uh, if I would have known by the time I would have done more research, is like reading your report. The first thing when you are handed out with the uh, your sugar level and then your cholesterol, that paper, you just bring and put it in a drawer and you just follow the medication which your GP has prescribed. So you only follow the medication. You don't know what actually happened to your body. Yeah. And all the terminology, like how this... Um, trigal side goes up, how this LDL goes up. And then what is insulin? Why my um, insulin level is high or low? And yeah. is really my pancreas working or it's given up? Like for me, being a type two, my um, insulin pancreas a little uh, not work, performing well. So that's why I'm not type one. But I'm a little bit curious and I might be a, in a LADA case. Like there's one more term which we have uh, hardly heard about. Like we know type one, we know type two, we know uh, just gestation, which is for the uh, woman during pregnancy, but this Lara is 1.5 and type three is a dementia. So more you get into the depth, more you are getting more info and there are lots of information. And at the moment, what I'm doing is I'm trying to get into all the uh, terminology and trying to educate myself and get, trying to inform myself like, if I'm taking uh, some kind of medication, what kind of side effect will I get? And how to get rid of this medication if possible, if it's practical. That's how my walking in the morning work well to minimize my sugar level. So that's how getting into and keeping yourself informed and educated is the key to maintain uh, a condition which we have, which we can't get rid of. Yeah, absolutely. So just in case anybody's a little bit confused about some of the terms, because there are, so, oh my gosh, isn't isn't being diagnosed with diabetes like learning another language? Um, so there are just a couple of um, things just to mention in there. So LADA, it stands as LADA, it stands for Latent Autoimmune Diabetes in Adults. It is a, it's an, also an autoimmune condition like type 1 diabetes, but it's a slower onset of type 1 diabetes. So actually there are a lot of people who are diagnosed as adults with diabetes automatically assume that it's type 2 diabetes because there's an age thing in there and 
people and unfortunately health professionals don't necessarily know all that much about LADA or the people at, that adults can be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when actually it's a slower onset of type 1. That's one of the reasons why it's always super important to have conversations with your healthcare professionals. Learning as much as you can so that you can drive those conversations is a really great way to stay informed and to really drive the agenda of your healthcare. There are some really great comments coming in. Somebody has just said that Natesh is raising a lot of helpful info and ideas, so well done. Um, and someone said the right endocrinologist is a must. We we had one that my son and I felt like we were sitting uh, in the principal's office. And that's the last thing that we want. You know, it's, it's not... It's not a place to be told off. And I think that, you know, when we have healthcare professionals on here who are, you know, just so um, wonderful about, you know, being there to support people with diabetes. Last week we had Cheryl Steele, a diabetes educator from Western Health here, and, uh, you know, very, very much about supporting the person with diabetes, supporting the choices that they're making and working with them to get the best possible outcomes. I think that's really important. But Sarah, I want to ask you that same question. What are the sorts of things that you would like to say to somebody who is newly diagnosed with diabetes? Those sorts of things you go, gosh, if I'd known that, you know what? I want to share that with everybody so that they know it from now. Um, I, when I got diagnosed, I, I sort of grew up expecting I was going to get it because my mum had it, her dad had it, my mum's siblings had it. Um, but even though I knew that, when I got diagnosed, even though I still asked the doctor every time I had a blood test, when it happened, I still felt like a truck had hit me. Of course, um, yeah. uh, that I wish I'd known that you'll, it's like, you'll get over it and eventually you'll have your medication sorted and you'll learn how to deal with it. Uh, and also... Uh, I think people need to be their own biggest advocate. Yeah. They, um, know what medication you're taking. If you don't get along with your endo, do your best to get another one. Get a team like your GP, your endo, your diabetes educator and a pharmacist that will support you yeah. and that you can talk to and that you can ask questions because it's your health and it's your life. And uh, like I... I saw an endo, not my current one, but I left. I, I sat through the appointment and cried and I left in tears. And oh, I'm um, sorry. he, uh, anyway, so that's, I got, a, I got a really awesome guy now, but I advocated for myself in the public system to get a different one. So don't be afraid of speaking up and speaking out because it's your health. Yeah. Oh my gosh, such great tips that we're hearing. I think one of those things that if I'd known earlier on would have made a big difference was understanding that diabetes isn't just about numbers and it's not just a clinical thing, that it is very much also what's going on up here. Um, and I really, um, gosh, if I'd known that I could speak to a psychologist and that was part of what diabetes management was about, was having... Um, you know, understanding and, and it being okay to, to feel some days like I'm really overwhelmed and feeling burnt out was understandable and normal. If I'd known that, I think I would have much sooner been able to address those issues because I felt that it was me that was being a failure because I wasn't just getting on with things because that is how it's so often presented. Um, so that's one of the one of the pieces of information that I love to share is that, you know, when you are first diagnosed and you're speaking with your GP, if it's a GP who's diagnosing you or if you're, um, you know, being sent out in with a multidisciplinary team and you're seeing um, all of the people that you've mentioned there, Sarah, also ask about a psychologist. Your GP can write you and can help you um, with a, a mental health plan. Um, but I just think that that's got to be one part more that, you know, we're speaking about that a little bit more and we need to keep talking about that as part of diabetes care. All right, we're going to wrap up very shortly. There are, there are such great comments coming in. I am reading through them. Um, but, yes, so I, let's let's do this. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot. This is a bit mean and I'm coming straight to you, Nitesh. The one thing, the one biggest piece of advice that you want to say now about a small change that people can think about making that you think will make a really big difference. Go. The one and only change that you can bring is don't trust or don't 
follow the stereotype thought like if you have diabetic in your genetic, you will get the diabetic. It could be manageable. It can be changed. I'm a good example of living example. Like I end up using medication from last 10 years, but now I'm medication free. The only thing I did is the small change is my lifestyle change and my food habit change. So that helped me to come out of this uh, whole uh, medicated world. So that means if I can achieve, you all can achieve. And what we have a tendency, I've seen in my family as well, they said like, oh, my dad has this, my mom has this, we'll get that. No, you won't get that. Don't put yourself on that particular position. You just challenge how you're going. Yeah, that's in your gene, but how you won't get that and how you will uh, enhance your livelihood and your well-being. So keep positive and always challenge yourself because it's evolving world. New thing is coming up. New research are coming up. So keep uh, following the doctors and experienced people who are sharing the stories like Renja, and even Dr. Breslin, Dr. Jason Fong, there are lots and lots of experts out there who are easily available in internet, but don't only just trust whatever you have, do your own research and always consult with your, with your uh, health professionals. Fantastic, thank you. What about you, Sarah? What's that one thing that you think that, uh, you know, here's a little change, but it could actually have huge, huge uh, meaning in your life? Um, uh, applies to diabetes and everything. Uh, don't be afraid to stand up for yourself, even if it's like um, you're out with your mates, you've had some insulin or whatever, it's your time to eat. Yeah. You need to eat by, say, 7 o'clock. You eat by 7 o'clock. Don't just stand up for yourself like what in whatever it is. And that's just like an example. I can remember that happened a few times when uh, I was recently diagnosed um, and the people around me just didn't get it yeah and I understand that so yeah, yeah don't be afraid to stand up for yourself oh Sarah you're such a great advocate somebody has said Sarah thanks for sharing so helpful I feel that we've been so lucky with uh with having a chance to have a chat with you both today thanks for joining us uh this campaign um uh if I had known and I know that we have shared all of the information it's proudly supported by AstraZeneca so thank you to AstraZeneca who have supported it it has however been completely developed by Diabetes Australia and we're thrilled that we have um been able to work with some incredible people in the community who have um, been able to share their stories. It's very generous of you to come out and share your stories with us. And, and, um, and that's always so wonderful. Learning from others is an absolute cornerstone of the work that we do. So thank you very, very much. We'll be back in a week or two with our next um, Q&A. This will be up on our Facebook page forevermore. You can share this with people who may not have seen it. Please do share it with your networks. It'll also be on YouTube soon. So thank you very, very much. And Liam or Donna, I'm not sure, quite sure who's driving this behind the scenes today, but we can end our broadcast now. So thank you very, very much.